Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord, for this time that we gathered together in your name to talk about love, about family life, about reaching out to others, and about showing compassion and grace to everyone that we interact with, especially our family members, Lord. So, Lord, we commit the speakers tonight to you, and we commit the discussions and the facilitators and all the participants to you. We thank you, Lord, for the committee that's organized this, and bless and praise you, Lord. Make this a worthwhile and fulfilling session together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, today we are going to have our praise and worship session led by Sister Peace. So today we are going to sing love song, right? It may be a new song to each one. But let's have a time, let's have a time together and, and, and enjoy the song at the same time. Do reflect on the love relationship with our Lord, the first love that with our Lord, the journey that we have with our beloved Abba God, our Lord Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit.
perfect union nothing in between i am yours and you are mine there's a table just for you and me Break the bread and pour the wine Perfect union Nothing in between I am yours and you are mine Yours my first love, you're still my only one, you're still my first love, you're still my only one, you're
you Allah God for this beautiful moment that we can sing a love song together with all children of God that come together as today our message that I'm going to share by our speaker about the kingdom marriage principle but here we want to come before you oh Lord God to come back to you to remind us the very first love that you have together with us and as the past three weeks we have a family story time but today we are going to recap what is the past three weeks journey that building up for the coming weeks that step by step from story to story remind us about this covenant that beyond an old old story but this covenant it is still living in us Even though in Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, we have read weeks by week. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with all your hearts and with all your soul and with all your strength. This is the commandment that the Lord gives to us and to be in our hearts and it's a reminder to us to impress this commandment these very words in the heart of God and to our children talk about them even when we are sitting at home when we are walking around the road when we lie down or even when we get up even tie them as symbols on our hands and bind them on our forehead. Write them on the door frames of each of our house. The story rhymes still continue from the story of Noah, Abraham, Moses, David that we have played a video of this beautiful covenant stories. It reminds us about the relationship with God. It reminds us that it is not just a covenant. Even nowadays, when we say we make a agreement in this world that is a responsibility that is a words to keep and this is more than what we understand this partnership it is with God hearing and obeying is a Shema journey it's a love journey keeping this commandment it's not just an old old story and they are alive and even alive until today for Jesus is our living God he come and give us this new covenant and the story of life that's a testimony of the kingdom life that flowing in each one of us children of God Life shining with Jesus Christ in the center and abundant life that shine in the broken world. That we need it so much, especially time as such. 
and these covenant, covenant stories continue to flow even into very primary units of this community, family as one, become one and under the covering of the Lord. Finding the narrow path, even though it is not an easy one, a common one, but a heart desiring and willing to step up. And we have the second week that reminds us to remove these stones that in life so that we can have abundant life, we can enjoy the fellowship, the partnership with God. And last week that we talked about the priority in life, align God in life, that the abundance continue to flow and this come to this week about the marriage covenant the marriage principle in god's eyes and this stories continue until the end of the september where we have the stories of in gathering and shukot this is what last week pastor Hawk has put up a beautiful pictures believing in Jesus having Jesus in life is not a passport to heaven but it's a partnership and we with this partnership that we can align the structures that he has built up and this week as we flow into the marriage it is not just husband and wife a couple but one we want to share the story is that is the mystery that God had put in from Old Testament to New Testament from the culture of where Jesus come from and he have used a lot of stories parables pictures of God wedding plan that have this painted out this journey for his people and what we have shared, the covenant by, Ab by Noah, Abraham, Moses, and even King David. But all this was broken because of the stubborn heart of the people, the stiff neck of the people. And Jesus come for this new covenant that he fulfilled all that was in the old. And this week, before Pastor Sylvan is going to share on the message on the marriage principle, I just want to tell you a story that God has a wedding plan for all his people. That in the Hebrews culture, where Jesus come from, that is steps for a marriage supper. From choosing the bride to the Grooms agree to pay a price for the bride and then they make a covenant and there will be a betrothal consent of the bride and there will be a covenant cup. They will need to run through a ritual cleansing. Then there will be departure of the groom and then the groom will go and to set up and prepare. From there, the groom will give the bride, a gift to send to the bride. Then the bride will need to wait for the groom to be back. And the bridegroom return for the bride at due time. And the couple is covered and hidden in the wedding chamber. Then when the bridegroom came, there is the marriage supper. So this is the pictures of how God relationship with his people is beyond partnership. It is a marriage covenant. From the father chose Israel and the father chose the church and the groom agreed to pay and to make a covenant in the Hebrews 
It is named as Ketubah. It is a marriage covenant. In the base of the Mount Sinai, when Moses received the Ten Commandments and come down and talk to the people, this is the words of God, this is the covenant, and this is the commandment. And this is the people replied, Moses, we will do. It is a marriage words that I do. When the covenant laid before, and we say, and come forth and agree and say, yes, I do. And that is where the covenant cup, when Jesus drink with, the, with his disciple, and the departure of the groom, that is where to prepare the kupa, the wedding place. And then the groom will send the gifts to the bride. That is where Lord Jesus Christ gave his spirit on the day of Pentecost. When believers that come to Christ, that is a gift that from the groom, which is the Holy Spirit. And that is not doing nothing, waiting for the groom to be back, as this covenant still holds. The bride have a role to be prepared and be ready every day until the groom return. And he will be back on the one day surprise her that the couple will be covered and hidden in the wedding chamber which is named as Kupa it is also like a tabernacle it is a covering then where all this is set that is the marriage supper that will be laid before those who are married you are very familiar with this oath. This is one of the kakuba in Hebrews culture. It is a verse that is from Songs of Song. I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. It is not just speaking between a couple, but it's a love language that from the Father, from our Lord Jesus, that I am my beloved and my beloved is mine and if we see the words that in this covenant it is not just partnership it's as we embark on a life journey and this life journey is that we we agree to walk with Christ that we promise to love, cherish, encourage, inspire and our heart fuse together and create a unique bond with friendship and compassion at the core and may we continue to grow together and maintain the courage and determined to pursue our desire path and all these words carry intimacy relationship and the day when Moses went to Mount Sinai and receive the two tablet stone. That commandment is not just a heavy word that we need to bear. It is a marriage covenant. And because it is say love the Lord our God. I am the Lord thy God and shall no other gods before. In the first and second commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ, it summarized these two stones. It did not come and abolish, but it come and fulfill and come and tell us to love our God with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. That is the love covenant with God. With that, that we can love others. We can love our spouse, our family's member. 
and even this covenant is so important and it is kept in the Ark of Covenant. And even in Hosea chapter 2, it mentioned, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteous and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the Lord. So last week we did mention about all this Sukkot tabernacle, which is a temporary shelter, dwelling place, tabernacle, Sukkot for ingathering. And it is a story for rehearsal for something great yet to come. Does it look familiar to you during those marriage ceremony? It is also a covering. A pictures of this covering that this marriage covenant that have from the old old story and carrying up to now. It is one day the great marriage supper that God has prepared for his children that the gloom has come. It's going to come Welcome the bride. So just want to read to you Songs of Solomon. Draw me into your heart. We will run away together into the king cloud field chamber. We will be we will remember your love, rejoicing and delighting in you, celebrating your very kiss and better than wine. One righteousness adores you. In the day of atonement, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify the fast and call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregations, assemble the elders, gather children and those who even breastfeeding. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride come up from her kupa. The marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. He brought me to the banquet house and his banner over me is love. When he will return from the wedding, his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. The Lord shall be the king over all the earth. Feast of the tabernacle forever be observed by the world. So this is the day our family story time. Thank you very much. So I'm going to pass the time to Pastor Simeon. Thank you so much, Dr. Grace and Good evening, everyone. It's so good to be with you again today. And um, we have a special topic for you tonight. It's in regard to my beloved. So let's begin with the word of prayer. Father, just thank you so much for this time. We ask Lord, that you would use the teaching today to impact our hearts and impact our relationship with our spouse and for our family. And and our relationship with you as well. So Lord, just thank you for your presence with us, and we give you praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's morning time here in Houston, in America, and today it's a really, really special day. Um, for Kay and myself, we're celebrating a very special anniversary today. 
and I'm just so glad that I can share it with you. Today we're celebrating our 819th day anniversary. So, so it's a special day. Let me get the PowerPoint here going for you. Um, the last three weeks, these are the three lessons that we have looked at. We dealt with the kingdom life. What kind of life do you want? The reason that we're dealing with this is because Jesus promises an abundant life. And the kingdom of God, the abundant life, it's filled with righteousness, peace, joy, love, even power, but that power has a great purpose for us. That we have a great purpose in our lives. So the first question that I ask people is, what kind of life do you want? What kind of marriage do you want? What kind of family do you want? I know what kind of marriage I want. I want the life that Jesus wants to give me. I want it to the full. He said, I'm going to give you life and and you can have it abundantly. You can have it to the full. But in order to do that, Jesus said that we have two paths that we can choose, either the narrow path or the wide path. It's the narrow path that leads to life and the wide path that leads to destruction. We also look at the key factor in determining what we do in our life, which path we take, and it's what's in our heart. Now, in step number one, if you and I choose from our heart that said we want this kind of life, then it's so much easier for us to, to, to begin to live after it, to go for it. Now, the second week, we looked at removing the stones, what's in our heart. So we look at verses that talk about the negative emotion, the sins, and the lies that we can hold in our heart. And all of us have some sort of negative emotion, some sort of sin, or some lies that we believe in. However, if we are able to remove those stones, what if we can remove the anger? What if we can remove the fear? What if we can even get rid of the depression and the sins from our heart? Would we not have more peace, joy, love, and a greater purpose in our lives? So that's what we looked at on the second week. And the third week, last week, we looked at the priorities in our life. What should be the important thing? What really are the most important things in our life? We don't really think about what's the most important thing until we don't have too much time to live. And that's when we really think about what's really important. And from God's perspective, the most important thing is relationship. Relationship with God, relationship with one another. That's why when Jesus was asked what's the greatest commandment, it's all about love. Loving God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and loving our neighbors as ourselves. And the closest neighbors are our spouse and our children. So this was what we looked at last week. Establishing kingdom priorities. What does it mean to put God first? Well, last week we saw in the Bible, it's to love him passionately with all our heart, soul, and mind and strength. And, and if we do love him, it means to obey him in every aspect of our lives. In the Bible, say it's actually easy to do that, but not until we remove those stones from our heart. If we have the stones in our heart, it's very difficult to obey God. Let me give you an example. If you have a husband and wife, and they're angry with one another, and they come to you and you tell them, well, just obey what the Bible says. Husband, just love your wife as Christ loved the church. Wife, just submit to your husband. It's not easy to do that at all, especially if you have a lot of anger and a lot of hurt. 
But once the anger and the hurt are removed, then it's very easy for us to do those things. Well, this week, we are going to be talking about marriage and the relationship. Last week, we talked about relationship with the Lord. This week, <clears throat> we are going to talk about the relationship with our spouse. You know, it's very interesting because the world's concept and understanding of marriage is very difficult. It's very different from what the Bible teaches. Let me give you an example. A couple of years ago, I was actually in Malaysia, and I was meeting with a pastor who had been married for one year. And he and his wife took me out to lunch. And he said they were having some marriage issues. And so they wanted me to see, they asked if I could help them. So they said this, he said, marriage is so challenging. But he said, it's okay. It's helping me grow. But really, it wasn't okay for them because they were having problems and they were coming to me and asking if I could help. Now, see, this is one view of marriage. Oh, marriage is so difficult, but it's okay. We're going to grow from it. You know, before Kay and I got married, um, let me, let me go ahead and share with you the story. Maybe you've maybe you've heard this before, but let's just let me share this so we all can be on the same wavelength. But I'm going to share my story of how I met Kay. Kay is my second wife, and um, after my wife died, I was doing my first wife had passed away. I did some training in Japan, and in the first training I was there, I met Kay. I talked to her for a couple minutes, and then six months or so later, I went back to Japan, and I was invited by her pastor to go to her church, and I did some more training there for them. This time, I talked to Kay for eight minutes. First time I talked to her for two minutes, two plus eight, 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, I knew that she would be my wife. It was shortly after that, that I called her pastor and said, I would like to court Kay with the intention of marrying her. So during our courtship, we were getting to know one another and we, started growing in love for one another. Kay at that time was 42 years old and she had never been married. This would be my second marriage. But she was very happy at that time. I was very happy at that time. But some of Kay's friends began to come to her and said this to her. Hey, you're so happy now. You know, you're dating. You're dating Pastor Sunni and you're happy now. But we want to share something with you. After the wedding, after the honeymoon, things are going to change. So that's what they were telling you. Things are going to change. I remember a couple of weeks before the wedding, I went to get my hair cut. And as I was getting my hair cut, I was very happy. And the lady that was cutting my hair, she asked, why are you so happy? I said, I'm getting married soon. She said, oh no, oh no, you will have more white hair. You are gonna have more white hair. Kay was hearing from her friends, after the wedding, things are gonna change. And after the fourth person or the fifth person, she was beginning to get worried. See, this is the world's view of marriage, that after the wedding, things are going to change. You will have more white hair. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be so hard. So she came and asked me, is it true? Will things change after the wedding? I told her, I said, okay. I agree with them. Things will change after the wedding. 
but I'm going to love you even more. But how could I say that? Because I see it in the Bible. The Bible tells me that marriage is such an incredible thing. It's an amazing thing. Yeah, because the Bible said, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and receives favor from the Lord. So the Bible didn't say, okay, after you get married, it's going to be so hard. In life, it's going to be so hard. It said it's going to be amazing. Do you remember the story about the first wedding? God put Adam to sleep, and he took the rib out of Adam's, uh, one of the rib, and then he created Eve, and he brought Eve to Adam. Do you remember what Adam said during that first wedding? What did Adam say? He said, did he say, bone of my bone? Flesh of my flesh? Actually, believe it or not, Adam didn't say, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. This is what he said. He said, wow, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Yeah. How do I know that? Because during our wedding, when Kate's father brought Kate down the aisle, and when I saw her, I didn't go, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. When I saw her, I was like, wow, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Yeah, it was so, so exciting. During, um, you know, I mentioned after 10 minutes of getting to talking to Kay, I decided to, um, uh, called her pastor not too long afterward. And I said, Pastor, I would like to court Kay with the intention of marrying her. So I went back to America and Kay stayed in Japan. And, oh, by the way, he mentioned that to Kay. Everybody was so surprised, you know, that because nobody knew that I was even interested in Kay. So, after he told her that, I gave her a choice. I say, hey, I am in Japan one extra day in Tokyo. Would you have time to visit me? I'd like to get to know you more. Uh, or if you want, I can fly to where you live in your town there where the church is and just spend a few hours with you. So she agreed and that's when we had our first date. She decided to come to Tokyo and, and visit me. So we spent maybe four or five hours together that day. You know, just went to the cafe, went to the restaurant, went to the park, and we got to know one another. After that, I returned to the U.S., but Kay stayed in Japan, and we began our courtship. Our courtship lasted 14 months because we had to wait for our fiancé visa from the U.S., so when I went home, we would use, I would use my phone to talk to her for, you know, for 14 whole months, we would be talking one to two hours every single day. And by the way, even now, we still talk one to two hours every day. So we would be talking on the phone and after a week, I said, no, 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 this phone is not good enough for me. So I upgraded to my laptop because I could see more of her. You know, it was so incredibly amazing, just the time that we were having. I did not begin the courtship with love because I didn't know her. I only talked to her for 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, I knew she would be my wife. But as we began our courtship, and as I got to know her, and as she got to know me more, the Lord began to give me more and more love for her, and her more and more love for me. And it was so beautiful. You know, we would talk for one, two hours every day, but even one, two hours was not enough. I remember one day I was talking to her, and uh, 
It was 6 a.m. Houston time, and I had a meeting that day at 9.30. So we talked for a couple hours. It was around 8 a.m. already. And um, so, and then we talked some more, 8.30, so two and a half hours. And then two hours, 45 minutes. And then when we got to nine o'clock, I'm thinking, wow, I need to take at least 15 minutes for getting my shower and getting ready and then 15 minutes to drive to my meeting. So at nine o'clock, I said, well, who needs 15 minutes of shower? I can do it in 10 minutes. So I talked to her for five more minutes. At 9.05, who needs, I can take a shower in five minutes. 9.10, 9.15, who needs a shower anyway? The reason I share that story with you is because I just couldn't get enough of spending that time with her. And it was just such a wonderful, wonderful thing. Now, today we're celebrating our 819th day anniversary. Things have changed. You know, a year ago, we were helping a couple from Europe with their marriage. And usually when we work with people in the marriage, we would ask them this kind of question. If you could rate your marriage from a one to a 10, how would you rate it? 10 being like perfect. And we were talking to this couple a year ago, and they said, well, their marriage was maybe 6, 6.5. So they asked us, what about your marriage? He said a year ago, maybe 8.5. Well, a month ago, we started um, ministering to another couple, a pastor and his wife, and they're, they're struggling with their marriage. So we asked them, how would you rate your marriage? The pastor said, well, maybe a four. The wife said, maybe a six. So they asked us, and Kay said, it's a 9.5. In one year's time, it went from an 8.5 to a 9.5. Things have changed, but it got even better. Why? Because the Bible said that you and I can have the most incredible, amazing marriage, that the two can become one, that finding a wife, find what is good, and we receive favor from the Lord. So I am not going to accept the world's experiences and make it my reality. I said, no, 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 no. It doesn't matter if 99% of the people say marriage is bad, marriage is tough. The Bible said I can have an incredible, amazing marriage. The only question is, how do I get there? Because the Bible said, Jesus said, I can have an abundant life. And, the, you know, abundant life includes abundant marriage, an abundant family. It, it would not be, oh, I can have an abundant life, but my marriage will be so broken. I mean, who, who can say, oh, my life is so abundant, I hate my wife. No, 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 it makes no sense. God wants to give you and me this abundant life and an incredible abundant marriage, an incredible abundant relationship with our children, family. So I said, I'm not going to accept people's experiences and make it my reality, not when it goes against the word of God. What does the word of God say? Now, if the word of God says so, how do I get there? How do I get there? So we want to look at marriage principles today. So taking what we have been talking about the last several weeks, what kind of marriage do you want? What kind of life, what kind of marriage do you want? I know what kind of marriage I want. Some people are settling for okay marriage.
I am not settling for an okay marriage. No. No, 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 no. What do you want? And then what hinders you from having that kind of life? Do you know what stones are in your heart that causes you not to be able to walk in that marriage life that God has for you and me? Do you know the number one cause for marriage issues? If you look in the internet, it says maybe communication, maybe finance, maybe lack of intimacy, and those would be in the top 10 or top five. But I discovered the number one root cause of marriage relationship issues are the things that are in our heart. When I help people get rid of the stones in their heart, the negative emotion, the sins, and the lies, then marriage and relationship can be healed and restored very quickly. But if you deal with the symptoms of just the communication, finance, or these kind of things, can it help? Yes. But all the issues keep coming back up over and over and over again. And then where's your spouse in the priority list? Where's your spouse in your priority list? My order is this, God first, wife second, children third. It's always been like this for many years now, <clears throat> no matter what my situation of life might be. Even when I'm traveling, even when I was um, had little children, when my kids were very small, when they were one, two years old, I've always had plenty of time for my wife. Even when I travel now, you know, the year before COVID, I was traveling two weeks, two and a half weeks, a month, 11 months out of the year. But when I come back, whether I'm in Houston for one week or two weeks, I give my time to my wife and my children. Why? Because they're my priority. Now, today we want to look at if we put our spouse at a high priority, how do we do so? How do we get that incredible, amazing marriage? How can we have this kind of relationship? Well, for us to understand that, we need to first understand the differences between a man and a woman. What are the man and the woman's greatest needs? Do you know the differences between men and women? Do you know what the greatest needs are for a man and for a woman? Because the Bible tells us so. But what's the difference between a man and a woman? So what are those differences? Let's take a look. How do we discover the differences between men and women? Number one, think about this. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. And let me see if you can, some of you can help answer this for me. I'm going to start the PowerPoint. And you can answer it straight by video, talk to me, or you can send it through chat. What do little boys like to do in Malaysia? What do little girls like to do? And that will give us a clue in terms of what's the difference between men and women. Anybody has a thought? What, what do little boys like to do? What do little girls like to do? In Malaysia. Little girls like to have fun. Little girls just, like to have fun? Yeah, just playing and 
talking and eating. <laughs> like to talk, yeah. play, eat. Um, okay, nowadays they like to play with the handphone. Okay, I'm talking about the little boys, the little girl, the little ones. And it's true. It's true what Miss Judy like to say. Okay, Ivan said little boys like to run around, play rough. Little girls like to play with dolls and play house. Okay. Little okay. little boys like to dismantle things and put them back together. <laughs> It's Mandel, they put them back together. Um, Jurgen said, boys talk about toys and activities. Girls talk about other girls and about boys. Okay, true. Pauline said, nowadays, they like to play with their handphones. Now, in general, little boys, when they're younger, they love to play with different kinds of toys, whether it's um, soldiers, sports, guns, race cars, these kind of things. They like to compete and they like to win. They like to wrestle with their brothers, you know, and they want to win. In general, little girls like dolls and houses and dress up with mommy. Do you know why? It's because God made us differently. See, women, the most important thing for women is the love and the relationship. It's the dolls, the houses, the, the dress, the talking on the phone, the relationship. Boys, on the other hand, it's about competing, winning, getting the respect. That's why in the Bible, when God gave command to the husband and the wife, husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church. The greatest need that a woman has is love and relationship. The greatest need that a man has is respect. So God knew that. That's why when he gave us the command, husband, love your wife. That's the greatest need a woman need. Now think about this with me. When they get older, they, they become teenagers. All right. Which group, the boys or girls, teenagers, love to play with video games more? And which group like to talk on the phone more? Right? The little boys love to play with the video games more. The girls like to talk on the phone more. Why? It's the same thing. The boys want to win. They want to conquer. They want to do things. They're made for work. Much more so. Do, 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 do. It's the doing thing. That's more important. Now, this is in general. Now, I understand there are some exceptions. But in general, this is the difference between men and women. Now, as they get older, let's say um, they start dating. Well, let's talk about college first, college. Now, it may be different in Malaysia, but in America, guess what a lot of the college guys think about? Be honest. What do you think most college guys think about? A lot of them think about how to win the girl. And some even think about how to win the girl sexually. Just being honest. And as the women grow, and as they grow, you know, there's this thing that has to do with romance and romance novel or romance movie. It, romance become important in relationships. But do you think romance is more important for guys or for girls? 
What do you think? Anybody has a thought? It's romance. Which group would read romance novel more? Which group would want to go see romantic movies more? Which group wants more romance in their relationship? In general, girls, women, but Miss J. Burkhardt said, girls, but my husband is more romantic. I did mention there are some exceptions, and I'm so glad that your husband is more romantic. Women want to see more romance. Guys like movies like Van Damme and Bruce Willis. They like more of the action movies. Boys never really grow up. Even when we become adults, we like more action. We like more competition. We like the winning aspect of it. The ladies in general, with exception like Miss J, likes romance. Do you know what the word romance means? What's the definition of romance? If you do a search on Google, the definition of romance is this, the excitement and mystery associated with love. Excitement and mystery regarding love. Why do women like romance more in general? Because it has to do with love. Now, I don't know how many of you are married or how many of you are single, but let me ask you this question if you're married. When you were dating, was it romantic? And then, if you can answer another question, after the dating period, was it still romantic? Huh. Do you know what most women would say? So I've done this training in front of groups of people. And in a, let's say in a room of about 100 women, about 80% of the women would say, yes, we dated and dating was so romantic. And then after the wedding, only a few would say, my husband is still romantic. Most women would say, no, my husband is no longer romantic. As a matter of fact, they even forgot about the dating time. They said, my husband is not romantic at all. So then I ask, what was it in the dating time that made the time very romantic for you? So think about this, women, ladies, during your dating time, what was it about it that was romantic? What was it? Do you know what most people say? Well, some ladies would say, because he was whining and dining me, you know, would always take me out to dinner to my favorite place to eat. And in Malaysia, that's very important, you know, because Malaysia has such great food, you see. And then they would say, um, well, sometimes he buys me flowers. Oh, and I love it, you know, because he listened to me and he wants to get to know me. And we would spend time doing things together. Oh, for a woman. Oh, that's so romantic. Whoa. Why? Because for women, the most important thing is love, relationship. That's why all the romance novel in America is targeted to the women, you see.
So my question is, why do the men stop being romantic? By the way, by the way, all men can be very romantic if they want to. But why do you think men were romantic in general before the wedding and then after the wedding they stop? Why? Anybody has a guess? Look, this is about marriage relationships, so I want to hear your thoughts and opinions. Why do you think men stop being romantic after the wedding? Jurgen got it right on the dot. Jurgen said because they have completed their conquest. <laughs> They completed their conquest. For men, it's about winning and competing. How do I win? How do I get that girl? How? That's why in college, when they think, how do I win that girl? The men will do all it takes to get that girl. But once they get the girl, they say, we already got her. There's no longer a need to pursue her. Men are like that quite often, you know, even in the different activities that we do, like fishing, for example, I love to fish. But when I fish in salt water, I have to learn how to catch that fish. Recently, a few months ago, I started fishing in lakes in fresh water. So when I go to fresh water, I say, how do I catch that fish? It's different type of fish, different environment, a different way. How do I catch it? But you see, men can always be romantic if they want to. Let me give you an example. Let's say this man doesn't have a good relationship with his wife. And he's chasing after another woman. Do you think he can be romantic with the other woman? You betcha. It's not that men cannot be romantic. It's just that we think, well, we already got the girl. There's no more need to try. That's the problem. But do you know what I said? I said, no. I don't care if 99% of the men, Christian men, all around the world stop chasing after their wives. I am gonna keep chasing after my wife because I know what kind of marriage I want. I'm not gonna settle for a broken marriage. I'm not gonna settle for an okay marriage. I want the marriage that God wants to give me. I want the abundant marriage. So I'm gonna keep chasing after her. That's why Kay can say 8.5 a year ago and 9.5 just a few weeks ago, because I'm going to keep chasing after her. I don't care what other men do, because it depends on the kind of life that I want. See, if you and I want to have an okay life, an okay marriage, we'll settle for it. I was talking to the pastor and his wife that we're ministering to. He said, these are his words. He said, I thought it's okay to have an okay marriage. Do you know what an okay marriage looked like? He does his thing, she does her thing. Oh, we're okay. At least it's not a broken marriage. Maybe we yell at one another, but who cares about romance? It's all right. We're raising the kids, they're going to college, it's okay. She just does her thing, I just do my things. Look, 
I would settle for okay. If Jesus said, I've come, you might have life and your life will be okay. But he didn't tell me that. He said, I've come, you might have life and you can have it abundantly. I'm not going to settle for it being okay. I'm going to go after the fullness of life and marriage. But I have to do my part. So let's keep, let's keep going here. So we talked about romance. See, if you understand the difference between men and women, what's important for them? The women want to be loved. The men wants to be respected. And by the way, here's one more big difference between men and women. Women in America in general speak 30,000 words a day, English words. Men, on the average, speak 10,000 words a day, one third. Words are very important for women. And women want to be listened to. Men, on the other one, want to be valued for their opinion. They want to be respected for their decisions. They want to solve things. So when a woman has a problem, she's talking about it. And from the man's perspective, he just wants to get the problem solved. He wants to get things done. So he offers a solution. The woman gets upset. He said, I don't need for you to tell me what to do. I just need you to listen to me and care for me. Women just want the men to know that they are paying attention to them. They want to be loved the way they need to be loved. Men, on the other hand, want to be respected and they want to be praised for what they've done. Women want the men to show and remind them that they are loved. The men just want to be loved and respected the way they need to be loved and respected. You know, in the church, in general, usually, let's talk about the church for a few seconds. Let's talk about that. When we open the church up, it's usually the um, women that comes to church first. Because the church talk about relationship, about love. And the men have a hard time coming to church because it's relationship. And when they do come to church, the women sometimes say, husband, I want you to be like this man and that man. and be like the pastor. I want you to pray more. The men just get like, oh, no, 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 no. They hate it when they're being compared to other men. Why can't you be like this man? Why can't you be the spiritual leader? And they don't feel respected. All right, let's keep going. See, men hate it when women compare them and say that they don't do things well. The women, on the other hand, hates it when men pay attention to other women. Men hate it when the women don't listen to their solution. But the women hate it when the men don't listen and just want to give solution. Men hate it when women whine and complain that they're not being loved and that the men are not doing all these things and that. And the women hate it when the men don't tell them and show them that they are loved. It all has to do with love and respect. So God knew this, so he gave us his commands. Husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Wives, submit yourself to your own husband. But how do we do that? How do we love and respect the other person? Well, I'm going to give you three very simple principles. And by the way, sometimes it's hard to do this if you still have stones in your heart. And if you haven't decided that you want a greater things in your marriage. But let's say as a couple, you decide that you want something greater. And I know maybe a wife wants it, but the husband doesn't. And 
in our sixth lesson, we're going to talk about how to restore marriage, how to restore family. But today, I'll just give you principle on how to have a great marriage. Three basic principles. Do the things that make the other person feel loved and respected. Don't force the man love and respect, but rather be patient and kind, and then growing to become best friends. I discovered, because I know K needs love, I started to try to do things that make her feel loved and respected. That it's all throughout the day. When she goes about the day, when she has free time, when she's not doing well. So during the dating process, the most and very easy to do, you know, the flowers, the letters, the dining, the spending time, the listening, spending time together. After the wedding, I still do those things, but I do more. And, and sometimes it's very simple. Sometimes it's practical. You know, like within the first week of our marriage and after Kate moved into this house, I know that she was washing the dishes. So I would go behind her and I would give her a hug from the back. And I could tell she loves it. You can tell, you know, when your wife or your husband likes something. In this case, she kind of melted. She's like, oh, and I knew she loves it. So because she loved it, I kept doing more. So the last couple of years, at times she's doing the dishes. I just come behind her and just give her a hug, tell her how much I love her. And she loves that. I was sharing this story with my cell group one day. And a week later, the husband came, came back with the wife. He said, has to see me, it didn't work. It didn't work. He said, I went home the next day. My wife was washing the dishes. So I gave her a hug. And she said she didn't feel love at all. She said, I would feel more love if you did the dishes, not give me a hug. <laughs> the key thing is this. Discover and do the things that make the other person feel loved or respected. The same thing doesn't always apply to different people. And by the way, it doesn't always apply at different time. You know, when a person is very angry, sometimes they don't want you to hug them. So I began to discover the things that would make Kay feel loved. And she discovered the things that make me feel loved or respected. And we just started doing those things, including the things that I might not like. It includes some of these things, the gift, the letters, the hugs, the holding hand. I love spending time with her. I love to take her to places that she likes. I plan time to listen to her and to talk to her. I help her around the house. And I do my best to say good things about her. All of those things. Let me give you an example. There was this couple that we were ministering to in, uh, in Europe. And their relationship was about a six. So I asked the wife, what makes you feel love? She said, I feel love when my husband helps me in the kitchen. Do you know what the problem was? The problem was the husband didn't like helping out in the kitchen. And for many years, she could tell him, can you help me in the kitchen? No, I don't like it. So I asked the husband, what makes you feel love? He said, I feel love when my wife play games with us or watch a movie with me. But do you know what? I asked the wife, she doesn't like to play games. She doesn't like to watch movies. She thinks it's a waste of time. So for so many years, they're stuck at a six because they didn't want to do the things that make the other person feel loved because they didn't like those things. So I asked them, where do you want your marriage to be? They said, well, we want it to be like you guys in eight or nine. That week, 
they started doing the things to make the other person feel loved. She started helping in the kitchen. She started watching movies with him. And so I asked them recently, where's your marriage now? They said, oh, eight, 8.5. It's doing those things. You know, later, um, you'll learn about the five love languages. And the five love languages are great. The only thing is sometimes people think, well, if my wife's love lang language is gift, then the only thing that I should do is just give her gifts. Actually, it's not true. Every person has all five love languages and they need all five. Everybody needs all five. It's just timing and season. For example, for example, if your wife likes hugs or touch or hand holding, and uh, and so maybe that might be her love language. And so you do that, you try to hug and touch her and all these things, and uh, but when she's very stressed and she has so many things to do, and she didn't have the time to do it. And she's so stressed and you try to hug her. She's like, get away from me. I don't, I don't need your touch. But what she might need is for you to help in the kitchen because she has so many work to do, so much things to do. So I find the thing that makes my wife feel love. For example, what makes her feel love when she is not doing well? It's different than what makes her feel love when she's doing well. What makes her feel love when she has time or what makes her feel love when she doesn't have time. So for me, it's a discovery. Recently, I discovered, you know, I learned when she's not doing well, how to respond to her. There was one period about four months ago, she didn't do well, she was struggling and in some things for five, six days. And usually when a person is not doing well, they get a little bit more irritable, a little bit more frustrated, so they're not always as loving. So there were times she was not as loving. In the past, when she's not as loving, I'm not as loving back to her. This time I learned. I learned that when she's not doing well, how to love her. I was more gentle, I was more loving, I was more respectful all of these things. So when she got out of that period, she this was what she said. It, she said, it was so amazing. This time I was not doing well. I didn't respond well to you, but you were so loving to me. What makes a person feel love? Can do those things. I don't like to buy flowers. You know, for me, flowers makes no sense. It's very impractical. You give a woman flower, three or four days later, the flower dies. It's a waste of money. So from my perspective, it makes no sense at all. But I buy my wife flowers, why? Because I know she loves them. I do things to make them feel loved. Why? Because I know the kind of marriage that I want. And I'm not going to settle for anything less. Discover the things that make them feel loved. And do those things. It's an adventure. A wonderful adventure. And one of the things that makes them feel love, and I had it on my previous list, is to praise them and don't compare them. The world, you know, in the Chinese culture in the past, men are taught don't ever accept praise for your wife. If people say, oh, you have such a good wife, 
you know, as a husband, you have to say, no, 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 she's not good. She's so stupid. Oh, she's so foolish. I am not going to accept the world's culture when it goes against the word of God. I am not going to accept it. No, I'm not. Not at all. What does the Bible say? And I'm going to do those things. So praise them. And I do a good job of letting my wife know how much I love her with my words and with my action. So number one, do discover and do those things that your spouse feel loved or respected. Number two, don't demand no forced love and respect. Love is freely given. It's never demanded no force. How many of you, I know most of us have attended at least one wedding in our lives, but how many of you have been to a wedding where the bride put a gun to the groom's head? You can't force love. You can't. And sometimes, the husband or the wives, if you love me, you will do this. If you respect me, you will do this. And, and here's another problem, another problem that if you want me to love you, then you respect me first. That's what the men would say. And the women would say, if you want me to respect you, then you need to love me first. We always want the other person to do the things that the Bible tells them to do, but we don't want to do our thing first. So don't force it, don't force love. And by the way, don't even try to change them. You know, we have this tendency, especially for Asian, that if we see something bad in a person, that we should change them because it would be better for them. You know, I discovered this. Kay and I, when we were courting, I discovered that we had some differences. One of the major differences that Kay and I had was when it comes to communication and texting. I'm very good at responding to text. She's not very good at it. And when we were courting with her, when I was courting with her, there were times she took a while to respond to my text. And I'm like, there was time we had a meeting schedule and she missed it and she didn't communicate with me. And I was a little bit frustrated. I said, okay. And my thought was, I wanted to let her know, okay, you need to change this because it's more loving, you know, because you need to communicate. And so I wanted to, to change her. So, I was about to send her a text to try to change her. And then the Lord reminded me and said, look, Simeon, you've been living this way for 52 years. I was about 52 at that time. And she's been living this way for 42 years, for 41 years and 51 years for me, something along that line. So the Lord had me change my text. And my text was this, Kay, I love you very much. And this was while we were dating. I love you very much, but I want you to know that I feel more loved and respected if you can respond to my text sooner rather than later. But even if you don't, I will still love you. So Kay was so shocked when she received that text. She said, if you had tried to change me, I would, I would have been like, I don't know if I want to change, but because you were so loving to me, I purpose to make that change today. And from that day onward, she has been so good at responding. I didn't force her to change, but I need to share how I felt to her. And she was able to receive it. 
And love and respect comes with boundaries as well. Don't, don't forget that. Um, I do the things that make her feel loved, but I don't do those things that goes outside of the boundary of what the Bible says. Everything in the Bible has the boundary. Food has boundaries, sex has boundaries, um, love has boundaries. You know, we shouldn't be whining for love, we shouldn't be whining for respect, because sometimes we don't get it, so don't force it. If you whine for it and you try to force your husband or wife to give it to you, they eventually might give it to you, but, you know, they'll give it out of frustration and they're tired of hearing the other person whine and complain, but once they give it to you, it's no longer love. Do your part and don't force the other person to change. Lastly, becoming best friends. A friend loves at all time. One of my requirements for getting married, I had four requirements, but the last one was that the person will be my best friend. I didn't ask the Lord, Lord, give me someone who loves me. Why? Because people fall in love. A year later, they're no longer in love. Love changes. It comes and goes. It's like the wind. But the Bible said a friend loves at all time. So I said, Lord, give me someone who will be my best friend. Love will always be there. Kay is my best friend. You know, I enjoy her so much. I told Kay, Kay, I look forward to the wedding. This was when we were courting. I look forward to the wedding. I look forward to the honeymoon. And by the way, the Lord told me to have at least three honeymoons with my wife every single year. We've already had seven and counting. I told her I look forward to the wedding and the honeymoon. But what I look forward to even more it's the next day after the wedding. Because I'm going to get up in the morning. I'm going to look at you. And I'm going to say, wow. I can't believe God has blessed me with such an incredible woman. And I've been wowing at my wife for 819 days. I get up. I'm so excited to see her. I can't believe I get up. A lot of times we go to sleep holding hands. And then when I get up, I turn around or so, I look at her and wow, enjoy one another. I enjoy talking with her, shopping with her, driving with her, walking with her, ministering with her, playing, doing things, and teasing and joking with her. People say a strong marriage is when you pray together. That's really not always true. Life is not you know, spiritual, spiritual, spiritual all the time. You got the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual. Your marriage is much stronger when you pray and play together because you're friends. You're spending time with one another. It's not only five minutes of praying together in the rest of the day. You don't spend time with one another anymore. We work and we minister together. Now, I'm only giving you a summary of a teaching that I do on marriage, in kingdom marriage. And this is just a summary, but it's usually a full day's training. But it gives you a gist, an idea. Oh, I forgot a, another slide. Best friend communicate a lot. We communicate our calendars, our um, we know what's going on. We talk about finance. We discuss role, responsibility. We talk about everything, everything under the sun. We talk about sex. We talk about children. We talk about the Bible. We're best friends. We share things from our heart. We listen to one another. One of the we do talk about the Bible a lot and how it applies to our lives and our family's life. So in summary, do the things that make the other person feel loved or respected. Don't force or demand love and respect in becoming best friends. These are basic principles for having 
an incredible marriage. So I want to encourage you this week, ask your spouse how they rate the current relationship with you, the love that you have for them, and then find ways to show them love in the way that they need to be loved or respected. It will grow your relationship. Thank you so much. And Grace, Dr. Grace, I'm going to pass it back to you. And I will see you all next week. We'll talk about growing amazing kingdom families. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Simeon, for such a wonderful message. It's really um, practical <laughs> that, um, yeah, a relationship that if we can, we can treat each other um, as friends. Right. So um, we are going to have two minutes break. Okay. We we'll come back at uh, 9 10. Uh, do not leave yet because we will still have sharing from Pastor Hawk um, on the five love language. So, like what Pastor Sumin has mentioned just now, it may not just be one, but it can be all of them. So, um, you can have a small break. We will start at 9 10. Let's see you right after this. Those who are going to leave, um, please do remember to uh, put up the fill up the registration form so that we can have your email to uh, keep connect with you all, so that we can uh, um, send you the link for the recording and also. Um, to, to have the previous recording as well. I'm going to repost the registrations link at the chat box. Please do check on it if you haven't do the registration. Okay. So welcome back. So um, the second sessions will be Pastor Hawk going to share with us about the five love language. So um, apologies that tonight uh, Pastor Hawk will not be physically with us. Um, so, so he has uh, do a recording because uh, he has uh, another another meetings that he need to go with. So. Um, he have prepared uh, with us a very beautiful uh, video recording on this five love language. So let's uh, uh, watch this video together that connect with uh, what Pastor Sumian has shared. And this is what we have um, mentioned before. And last week, uh, Pastor Hawk did mention about Matthew 7. Whatever that we hear, we need to practice it and then have it um, uh, in our life so that it is like a wise builder, all right? So um, let's watch the 
message on the five love language. Then after this, then we will uh, break out into small groups to discuss on the um, topics that we are going to discuss. Right. Hi, good evening to all of you. I hope you have a wonderful time worshipping together and also receiving a teaching from Pastor Simeon so far. Um, I, my name is Pastor Hall. I'm here uh, for the third time. Uh, it was a wonderful time spent uh, even in the breakout room last week, uh, hearing and also sharing together with some of the brother and sister uh, in the group here. Um, I did mention a little bit last week uh, and also introduced myself uh, that I'm married to a Korean wife and a lovely uh, lady by the name of Jeannie with four young children uh, and also I'm going to share a little bit more on my journey uh, as a father and also as a husband uh, so that we will able to uh, learn from each other. Um, one of the things that um, I think Pastor Simeon has put in very well is that desire of that one thing that kingdom abundance life uh, that is our desire and also for the last week i believe uh, is talking about the relationship with our spouse and also um, this week i think just before this session uh, you were taught how to have a greater connection uh, or connectivity with together with our children uh, all these are the Lord, what the Lord has blessed us with and our desire. And uh, last week I shared that, you know, uh, let our home be, uh, let, let, uh, let our loving home be the uh, little heaven that we can experience. And that is the desire that God has given us that Lord, let the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven and it can manifest in your home too through our humility, through our desire of wanting to see this kingdom being manifested uh, in our own relationship, in our own family. Yeah. So um, as I mentioned, um, this week I'm going to share a little bit more about uh, five love languages. Uh, last week you have talked about the priority that you want to set for the family and this week we were going to look into some of the practical area that we can do uh, to express love and to receive love. Okay, so I have mentioned that um, this is not my own material. Uh, this is just something that I came across many years ago uh, by Dr. Gary Clapman. And these five love languages has been written in different version in a way. So uh, we can use it not just for our spouse, also to our children and also for our colleague and workspace. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to show you a two minutes video uh, that will explain this whole uh, teaching on the five love languages. And after that, we will come back here. Then I will share with you my personal journey uh, in terms of using this to express love to my spouse and also to my children and also some of the people that I got to know. Is that okay? So let's watch the video together. What's under the bed for? What's the what's the um the mud room for? They love each other, right? I, I, so why do they always feel like they're not on the same page? The most common issue in any relationship is the communication barrier. Everyone experiences love differently, and it's easy to miss the mark when it comes to showing that you care. In his early years as a marriage counselor, Dr. Gary Chapman noticed that over and over, couples voiced similar complaints regarding their marriage. One spouse would say something like, I feel like he doesn't love me. And the other would protest. I don't know what else to do. I'm doing everything I should be doing. Recognizing this pattern and remembering the Rocky start in his own marriage, Dr. Chapman poured through years of session notes. He asked himself, When someone said, I feel like my spouse doesn't love me, what did they want? Surprisingly, their answers fell into five different categories, revealing a unique approach for how to effectively love another person. The premise is simple. Different people with different personalities give and receive love in different ways. Dr. Chapman called these ways of expressing and receiving love the five love languages. He even wrote a best-selling book about it. This revolutionary concept has improved millions of relationships across the globe. These love languages don't only apply to couples. The concept holds true for friends, siblings, parents and their children, and relationships of every kind. Each individual has at least one primary love language that they prefer above the others. And that 
is where it really starts to get interesting. Want to intentionally strengthen and improve your relationships? You can start right now by taking the five love languages quiz to find out how you prefer to give and receive love. <laughs> All right, you have finished the video. So now we are going to look into these five love languages and what are some of the practical things that we can do in order to express and also to receive love from this uh, through these five love languages okay but before that i just want to really uh, bring us back to this very key verse uh, about love we know that uh, god is love and we know that we as a believer we talk about love we preach about love but a lot of time whether do we really put love into action or not yeah so one of the things that i always remind myself love is not love until it's being put into action let's read first corinthians chapter 13 verse 4 to 8 love is patient and kind love does not envy or boast is not arrogant is no or rude it does not insist on his own way is not irritable or resentful it does not rejoice as wrongdoing but rejoice in the truth love bears all things believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. Love never ends. For, for prophecy, it will pass away. As for tongue, it will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Yeah. So basically, it's to really remind us that a lot of time, um, we have to rekindle the love for one another. We have to come back to the first love. That's where we draw love from the Abba Father so that we are able to love the people around us so that they can experience peace of the heaven. Okay, so the first area or rather the first love language we are looking to is the word of affirmation. Okay, how to encourage and how to affirm someone, how to appreciate and empathize. And uh, expressing is not just uh, um, giving, but also receiving in terms of listening uh, actively. So these are some of the things that you can read, but I just want to share with you what are some of the things that we can do uh, in terms of uh, the word of affirmation. I want to share with you things that I have learned uh, from this uh, program called uh, Durano Father School. Uh, that's my photo with my lovely wife. This is probably uh, 10 years ago uh, when I first attended the course. Uh, we were asked uh, in the school, of course, we have homework. So one of the homework is to write letter to our wife and also to write 20 reasons why you love your wife. Okay, for those who are just newly married, you know, um, they'll, they'll find it so easy, you know, because they are like deeply in love. And like our pastor Simeon can even count how many days she, he has been <laughs> married. Yeah, but uh, I, I realize that as the older that you get, you no, know, it they'll find it so hard to even appreciate their wife, which shouldn't be the way. Okay. I think Pastor Simon have mentioned over and over again, it shouldn't let the love gone cold. What has gone wrong? But if we have that kingdom desire of really wanting to see our family, our love for our spouse and our children being aligned in the center of God's will. I think we will learn how to love one another. Okay, just share with you that if today I ask you to write 20 reasons why you ask your spouse, how long will you take to complete the assignment? Okay, so you can do that as a personal challenge, no price, but you do it. I will tell you there are some of the amazing things that can come forth uh, for that. Okay, on my uh, on the photo on the left uh, is a father from Kuching. Uh, it's a, uh, when we first asked them to do this exercise, uh, writing down the 20 reasons why you love your wife. So during the graduation, he passed the um, paper to the wife. So the wife read and then the wife was uh, in tears and the wife gripped over the mic and saying that, you know, what took you so long to write this 20 reasons? You no, know? I have married you for 20 years. I've been waiting for this word of affirmation for so long. So uh, it was a wonderful uh, testimony that you know, sometimes uh, sometime all that our wife need is a certain word of affirmation depending on the love languages okay so of course uh, during the graduation we get the husband uh, to sit uh, face to face with the wife and to read out the letter and also to uh, read them these 20 reasons why they love their wife and we seen a wonderful uh, uh, testimony coming out from that so that is one uh, thing that we can do uh, in terms of writing a letter to your wife and also write reason that why you love your wife okay and you'll be surprised you know uh, that how much uh, thing can come out from there 
not only to our spouse and this is uh, my son uh, he is 10 years old his name is joseph uh, his love languages is definitely word of uh, affirmation so what happened is um, this year um, there is this organization fathering movement in Kuala Lumpur by the name of Better Dads Malaysia. So they have come out this program called Back to School uh, with your with Dad. Okay, Back to School with Dad, and I participated participated and I joined them. So they give us the, this card. So basically, the program is to encourage the father to spend the first two days of the school, uh, to really prepare. Okay, prepare in, as in prepare uh, the kids to school. Um, prepare breakfast if possible uh, put a card of um, affirmation encouragement card into the snacks box snack box so that during the break time during the recess uh, the boy will open out your son or your daughter will open out and to read uh, a word from your father uh, to affirm you uh, during this uh, during this school time, uh, the first two days of the school, because most of the time, mothers is the one who doing that. So I find it's a wonderful uh, program, uh, activities that we can do for our children. Yeah, so my kids uh, love it so much that they actually keep this card aside because it is a word uh, they want to hear, you know, and also it will give them confidence in the school. So this is word of affirmation. Uh, the second area is a uh, physical touch. Okay, of course, it's a non-verbal but use body language and touches to um, emphasize love. I know not many people are the touchy touchy part. Okay, but for me, I, I love hugs. Okay, I need a hug. I need a manly brotherly hug. Okay, this is probably one of the things that we learn also. Um, in the in the father school again that we actually asked the man to learn how to hug during the first lesson uh it's pretty awkward you know it's not a very uh asian culture but we have seen how it break uh cultures you know? so this group of fathers that we always do father school together we have no problem seeing each other by giving a good manly godly firmly hug okay uh, to to really affirm one another and of course we ask them to go back to hug their wife and we heard tremendous story a lot of different stories some wives say what happened no no why suddenly uh, you hug me and stuff like that because they are not used to that and some wives say you you don't don't need to hug me you know and uh, i think it like it or not it just break a certain barrier i just want to talk about this uh brother here on my right hand side i will not mention the name uh, but you 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 will see uh, this is brother uh he came for father school he's one of the students that who refused to do homework uh he refused to write the letter he refused to go back to hug the uh, children and the wife or so but on the fourth day uh, on the fourth day when we have this graduation uh we invited he invited the family to attend and during the graduation one of the things that we do is ask them to hug their children and their and their wife and because of the pressure pressure okay pleasure pressure from the rest of the people so he has to hug the wife uh, and the children okay and we thought that is just it no everyone does it anyway but what happened after two days after the graduation he got a, a whatsapp message from the uh, son which he shared with us uh, after that the son uh, write like that that um, the son is 26 years old that time uh, the son said that you have been given me everything that I need uh, throughout my uh, childhood, also teenagehood. And, but what you gave me two days ago was something that I longed for for my, for my many years of my life. You know? Thank you for doing that so that it gives me confidence to love my family. So what happened is uh, the son who has never received a heart from the father uh, is actually about to get married at the age of 26 uh, just a few months after that he's supposed to get married but that hug a simple physical touch from the father it gave him so much confidence as a man to really learn how to hug the wife or to love the wife and also to love the children so that was one of the testimony after that this man who refused to do his homework uh, become one of the spokesperson for the father school. Uh, he went around uh, different uh, father school to share his testimony. So I just want to share this with you so that you won't take for granted. Sometimes a very simple thing. Sometimes we may not know how to. It's awkward for us, but it's not about us. It's about our children, how they want to receive um, the, the, the love. Okay, so some of our children really been longing 
just a simple heart or simple affirmation okay so let's move on so uh, this area is uh, the third area uh, which is the receiving gift okay um, so uh, gift is something that I think we all like to receive but not just any gift but it's about uh, practical gift that actually um, that show that you love and show that you care and show that you actually thought of the person okay this is one thing that I learned from one of the men uh, during a trip to uh, Korea while I was doing some training uh, or rather to attend a training and um, I was just at the end of the trip I said I don't know what to get for my wife anyway my wife is from Korea everything that I see here she probably uh, know where to get you know uh, and this brother told me don't worry just go into the shop just pick up anything so he even paid for my gift i'm so thankful of this brother or older brother who taught me he said you just go in to pick out an accessory and then i will pay for you and you bring back to your wife and but you make sure you say this okay this is something that he taught me how to share how to say to my wife that uh, make the present or the gift um of great value okay this is a line that he taught me okay so if we have any single man here you are learning how to court the girls please pay attention and write it down now okay so when you give the gift to the person that you like okay that you love you say this when i saw this gift i thought of you okay just as simple as that okay so it's not the gift that is important but the thought behind the gift so this is something that i learned and then i think during this time uh, churches and also us as a believer we should learn how to uh, express this love you know um, i i've been doing a lot just calling a grab car send a drink or send a food uh, to a friend even from out of sarawak here you know we are not limited by our uh, locality anymore but the thoughts of just sending something is to remind them that i thought of you and then i think this is something that we can do during this pandemic even to our loved one yeah even your children are probably overseas your parents are overseas uh, or even in in west malaysia no all you need to do is just order something that it can be delivered okay so this is a uh, gift uh, and of course this is the area the fourth area on quality time uh, i think uh, is quite straightforward it's about uninterrupted and focused conversation on one-on-one -on -one. Uh, it's very critical i think it's about paying attention uh, whether with our spouse whether with our children i think it's really about creating the memories together yeah uh, i have four young children so i know the important that if i don't do something now i will miss that uh, time okay one of my daughter uh, two uh, second daughter uh, the photo that we lie down on the bed one okay so she is one that will ask me sometime you know daddy can you not work today can you just spend time with us can you just play with us okay even just before i do this video he said do you need to do anything this afternoon uh, i said yes i have to do some recording but once i finish can we just uh, spend two hours just talk and play okay i'm going to play some soft toy with my two daughter right after this okay but what we do uh, during that time quality time you know just like doing nothing together but sometimes it's really just do whatever they like but i love this activity which uh, i would like to share with some young family here to try it's called knowing you and knowing me I think we can do it even when our kids grow up to see how much they know about me and also to test how much I know about them. Okay, this is what I do. So we will take turn to ask questions. So I will ask, uh, what is daddy's favorite food? Okay, she will answer. Then I will say, Dang, okay, whether correct or not. So that they will learn about me. Okay, so in return, I will ask, uh, she will ask a question. So she will ask, you know who is my best friend in my class? Then I will answer whether I got it right or got it wrong. Uh, I think this is a wonderful interaction that we really get to know one another, even as a family. Okay, so not only that, this pandemic has given uh, us plenty of time at home, so there are no excuse. But we wish that we, uh, we wish that this this uh, this time is a precious time that will create wonderful memories. So my kids love to watch a certain video, uh, especially by this guy called Zach King. Um, he he loved to make video magic. Okay, so um, 
I'm I'm a, from a media background, so I told them don't just watch, don't just spend your time watching, but to think how to produce a video like that. So during the pandemic, we, uh, I joined them. So we download some application on the handphone. We explore some video editing and to do some video together. And let me show you one of this video that we had done. So yeah, so uh, a lot of things that we can embark on together as a family, uh, you know, quality time. That's why I think end of this whole uh, session, which is on the last Saturday of September, we are going to do a virtual camp together. Uh, the whole desire is to, uh, to really prepare the family to go under a roof. Uh, whether a tent that you're going to set out or one, whether a tent that you have bought to really spend some family time together and to celebrate God's presence together with us. So I think this is something that we are looking forward and I hope that you can join us also. Okay, so lastly, this is an act of service and um, this is something that I think we all need to learn uh, to ask questions like uh, to our spouse or whether to our children. No? Is there anything that I can help? Uh, I think it will be very good uh, to model this uh, in our family. Uh, I'm going to share with you what happened in my uh, in our marriage uh, in terms of this area of act of service. Yeah, just I think uh, just last month I uh, got to know a brother. Uh, we're just talking about this love languages thing, and then both of us we were laughing that all our wife need is to do some house chore by throwing rubbish okay so chris i remember that huh so remember to do your house chore and not only that i think the house chore in uh, uh, uh is uh we must have the mentality that it doesn't belong just to our wife okay let me say this because i know that many housewives will say amen okay that we should not think that the house chore at home is solely the responsibility of our wife okay they don't have exclusive right uh, to the household because we live in the same home the laundry in the basket belong to us belong to our children so we have to cultivate that uh, culture to let our children know that hey when I ask you to do house chore doesn't mean that you are helping daddy mommy it's your work too yeah so I remember got one time I saw my why pretty work out you know with four young children i think you all can imagine uh she was also uh uh doing part-time lecturing and teaching and trying to take care of this husband also so what happened is one day uh, i just came to her and asked um i call her jagia okay jagia is korean uh and she said uh we i will really appreciate if you can help me to just bring down the laundry basket with in two-story house so bring down the laundry basket from upstairs to the washing machine and just put it in the washing machine okay so that it was her request and then I just thought that's it yeah do I need to hang the laundry no need you just bring the basket down and put it into the washing machine and sometimes I just want to say to all the uh, housewife here okay whether you are housewife or you are wife who do a lot of how to sometimes it take communication yeah give specific communication or give specific clear instruction to your husband men uh, uh, just tell you a secret okay men we cannot take uh, a lot of order one at least for me yeah I, i'm those like cannot multitask you can only tell me one thing so that's why i told my wife is one thing that i can do to make you happy you tell it to me so that was uh, something that i did for her and i learned that actually uh, just by partnering together with our spouse in doing some of the house show uh, it will bring much uh, love and peace into the household okay and why i put a coffee uh, cup here this just happened and this will probably be the last story i'm going to tell you within these 20 minutes that i'm going to share and this uh, coffee was uh, happened about a week ago um, I woke up and then one of the client called me uh, um, called beside pastoring I do some I have a media agency I'm a lay pastor so I I work to support my family so um, I, I got on my computer early morning and my son came in and she 
and he looked at me and then he said daddy is there anything i can do to make you happy oh wow i this is for my 10 years old boy he asked me daddy is there anything i can do to make you happy i said oh i will love to have a cup of coffee he dashed out he went out to prepare a cup of coffee and bring it back and then just put on my uh, desk I, I i stopped my work i stopped my work i looked at him and said son do you know that what you did really touches me you know where did you learn this from to ask a question like that is there anything that i can do to make you happy he said i saw you uh, asking that question to us and to other people so i thought it would be a good question to ask yeah so i think that is a very powerful question if we can ask that to our family member i think it show great appreciation it show that um we really treasure uh, each other that we want the best for the person yeah because he wanted daddy not to be like full of stressful face but to be happy so he asked that question and i responded that question and he gave me the coffee and it really made my day i was so proud of my 10 years old boy okay so if you are still wondering what are your first love languages or the second secondary love languages you can go to the website or just qr code just take a photo and scan it and you are able to do a survey but don't do it now because it takes quite long i would suggest that you do at the end of the session okay the reason why i i share all this thing because this is a verse that uh, i hang on to for some time now why i talk about uh, lengthy uh, time on on we need to practice love with our wife and also our children and this is one that i learned that first peter third chapter 3 verse 7 husband in the same way be considerate as you live with your wife and treat them as respect as a weaker partner as her with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayer yeah man if you want to have a prayer life that is open heaven that nothing hinder us be considerate to our wife and this five love language probably is a good way to start to be considerate to them yeah okay so this is one of the things that i would like to get you to do uh, in your breakup room in a while um, okay i will have to depend on um, grace and together with the rest of the facilitator so as you go into the breakup room first thing okay i didn't put this here the first thing is um, share uh with the rest of the member what is your primary love language you know from what you have heard so far you know if you really don't know maybe you have to do that quiz but you probably know what are the primary love language that you feel that you will get receive love okay and also i want you to write down your family members okay need not to be your children so if you are a children here you can write down your father mothers okay write down their names on the first column here then to identify what are their love languages okay for example if you think that the, this um, family members is gift i want you to turn that into action plan for the next two weeks something that you can do for the next two weeks okay so whether buy them a gift or send them a letter or just text them if you are staying with them maybe include in uh, cooking for them or helping your wife to throw rubbish or throw the trash and i think that uh, practically can be done okay so without uh without further ado i just want to end this session uh, with a prayer for you and i hope that it will be a fruitful um, breakout room time for all of you yeah father we just want to thank you and for the love that you have first demonstrated to us even as christ died on the cross as the ultimate sacrifice of love for us but a lot of time as a christian we just talk about love but we do not know how to love and we do not know how to receive love but lord tonight i just want to pray for my brother and sister here that even through the sharing open out their mind to see that god there are people there are family member that has been loving them knowingly and unknowingly and help them to receive that love that is true their family member and also father i just want to commit that activities even as they discuss they were able to turn this into an action plan to really express their appreciation and their love to one another so that lord your scripture said that we may show that the world that we are his disciple when we love one another and just want to pray that this love can be demonstrated in their home 
so that heaven will truly come upon every household that's represented here. I bless them in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So I will see you again. So have a wonderful time. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Amen. So I, I hope you all enjoy the, the video sharing on the five love language. It's a very simple approach, but it can be very impactful if we really um, really think of our family members, what are the love language that they primarily to with. And then um, like what uh, Pastor Hawk mentions, okay, it's not just end there. So we have to really think of action plan okay once again for the wise builder okay so it's about how to live it out so let's um we have a, a time for breakout rooms so for the discussions i repeat the the discussion point number one it will be what is your yourself okay the primary love language and then we go on to uh, the family members that you can have to put the name on and then what is um let's say my my daddy my mommy what is their primary love language so for the coming one or two weeks time okay so what i'm what am i going to plan to do with that uh, uh love language that i'm going to do so let's uh uh sister quinley can you break it up break us up into uh groups so that we can proceed with the discussion. All right, a short discussion for tonight so that we will be back at uh, 10.05. I'm so sorry that uh, today will be a bit uh, surpassed time five. Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> I hope you are happy. <laughs> A good time, even though a short one. <laughs> okay, we wait for others to come back. My, my group only got three people. <laughs> yes, yes. Just now, just now, just now there is Auntie one Hong that Lan. didn't. Ah, Auntie Hong Lan. I said, oh, you go to <laughs> Queen Lee's group. <laughs> yeah. Welcome back. Welcome back. <laughs> Okay, so you may not be uh, finished with the action plans that you all want to have for your loved one in your family. Uh, but it doesn't end here because it's too short time. So you can still slowly think about it. So we will have two weeks time, okay? Two weeks time. This is what Pastor Hawk had give us, a grace period. Okay, so every family members, then we have to come and find out what are their primary love language okay then to plan on something uh be reminded matthew 7 the wise builder okay we need to do something all right so it will just not just going to end there bye bye yeah so after two weeks so we, during the breakout room sessions we will have you all to share what you have to done and what is the impact okay so suddenly uh uh your son your son hug you okay uh, uh, your wife break into tears when you tell them <laughs> how you love them, okay? So I also need to think of something that I want to do for peace, yeah? My sister, okay? So um, just an a, a announcement for next week, yeah? Next week, we are going to have some actions, okay? So next week, we are going to focus on... Now, this week, we are talking about marriage, all right? So do remember about the stories that I tell you in the beginning, the marriage covenant with God, that intimate relationship with God is important for us to love others. So next week, we'll be focused on family, okay? So we are going to have peace and, and, and others to come into pictures and to encourage you all to dance together, okay? So if you, if you have children that with you in the same household encourage your, your children to come in doesn't matter it's five years old or four years old it will do as well okay 12 years old 15 years old can can dance together as well we're just going to have a time that we move together why we need to dance to worship the lord 
besides just singing. So, um, so we have the topics of dance with him. All right. So, so when 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 okay, the refuge is talking about um, the disaster and crisis uh, preparedness. Huh? So it is not just about when during the tribulations or, or challenging time we can stand, okay, but as well as we can dance with him in such a time, okay. So um, we are going to have a, 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 a practical time to dance with him, okay. So um, those who are first time joining us do uh, do look into the WhatsApp WhatsApp message the link to the registration. So once we get the registrations and we will have your email, we will send you the link, okay? The link, the Facebook link. In the Facebook link, it will have all the recording. So if you miss out the first uh, three, three sessions, you all can catch up from there, okay? All right, didn't see any links. So, uh, okay, I'm going to post, post in again the, the, the link, yeah? Give me five seconds. <laughs> okay. So, registrations link is here so that we, uh, our team will have the uh, emails to reply and then with the Facebook link that you will, you will, uh, um, even you can straight away go to Facebook and type the Refuge Malaysia. You go to go to go to the link and get all the informations before this. Okay. So once again, I want to apologize for the surpass ten minutes for this week. So um, we are going to close in prayer. Uh, I hope you all have enjoyed the sessions and have a blessed time. So can we have a uh, Dr. David? Are you there? Yes, yes, yes. I'm still here. Can you close in prayer? Sure, happy to do so. Thank <clears throat> you. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just want to thank you that we enjoyed this time together in your presence and each other. Thank you for your word to remind us, Lord, how we can build strong families and strong relationship with our loved ones, especially our spouse. Thank you for the understanding that indeed you have created us to be able to express love in so many ways. But Father, you are the Lord source of all love and that you are the one that can, Lord, uh, continue to touch us and transform us even as we ourselves journey together with you. Thank you, Lord, that you first love us. That's why we can love others. And so may you bless each one here and be with each one of us as even as we continue, Lord, uh, to uh, get to know each other through these uh, refuge sessions together, together in uh, this challenging time, Lord, where many people are so stressed out or feeling the strain. But we thank you that you have the answer, that your spirit can work in their hearts and touch them, even as we Reach out to them in love. Thank you, Father. And may you keep us safe from the works of the enemy and from COVID-19 or any kind of viruses or pestilence in the name of Jesus as we claim Psalm 91 for each one of us here. And bless us together even as we end this day, end this session, and prepare even tomorrow for those who worship you on Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all my beloved Pessy. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Gun. Thank you, Richard. Bye bye. And Jack. David. Jack. Bye. Take care. God bless you. Good night. Good night.